to all of you. Thank you all very, very much for coming out here this afternoon. Thank you very much to Bob, Professor Bjork, our director, for facilitating this whole thing. Very warm thank you as well to our outreach, outreach coordinator, the lovely young woman in the corner, hiding behind the camera, with Kendra, Kendra Terbeek, and to my other fellow lecturer, Marcia DePazio. And thank you, as Bob just said, more than anything to all of you for coming. We have a very interesting afternoon prepared for you because we have two women who have not been linked very much in history, but who do represent twin facets of the same era, and the era is called the early modern period. How many of you have heard the word renaissance? You've all heard the word renaissance. How many of you have heard the term early modern? Less, all right, and that's understandable because the entire time period, what is this time period? We're talking roughly from 1480 to, if I stretch it, about 1720, that's using a stretch definition. That period used to be considered the Renaissance and the Baroque. It is still called the Renaissance and the Baroque. But nowadays we use another phrase, which was coined by a very important scholar in France by the name of Serge Brzezinski, and that phrase is early modern. Okay, now what is this? Are we simply just playing with terms? There's actually a reason that we're calling this twin women, okay, of the global Renaissance, we're not using either renaissance, renaissance nor just early modern. What does the term early modern mean? We'll talk about renaissance in one second. I'm going to start with the obverse. By calling this the time of the early modern period, what Serge Brzezinski refers to is that the roots of the time that we live in now essentially begin in this time period. Why? Because so many of the situations that we're living now, we're here in the new world, what we call the new world, what we call the new world. The joining of the Americas and Europe and Africa, which occurred at that time, uh, sometimes in horrible and bloody ways and sometimes in very interesting intellectual ways, that is a product of that time, yes? Many of the racial problems that still affect our societies also come from that time. This was also the period of the most vast importation of slaves and conquest that had ever been known in human history. So can we call it the Renaissance? Well, there is, as Serge Brzezinski pointed out, a Renaissance in this period. We do have Michelangelo. We do have the great works of the Incas in Peru. We have Shakespeare in England. We have Calderón de la Barca in Spain. We have the tremendous efflorescence of art. That was Renaissance Italy, although we can't yet call it Italy because it was separate city-states. It's Genova and Firenze and many other places. There is that great artistic element. So Serge Grzynski says, all right, so we have a Renaissance in the early modern period. And nowadays we have another phrase called the global Renaissance. What does this phrase mean? Why are we using it? By the way, who said it first? We think the person who says it first um, is a very fine scholar of art history, actually of Incan and Spanish art history. Her name is Carolyn Dean. And she used the phrase global renaissance as a kind of midpoint between early modern and renaissance. Meaning, if we talk about this time period, we have to speak about it in a global context because this is the time when the world's jump. And so when people first began to ask Marsha and me why in heaven's name we were doing a program on a Venetian nun and an Aztec slave, and what is the connection with Venice? Well, I must inform you that when Hernán Cortés and the conquistadores got to Tenochtitlan, their first statement was, it was muy parecido a Venecia, it looks exactly like Venice because Venice was simply the model for the great city. And Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, reminded all of the conquistadors of Venice because just like Venice, it was built on the water in canals. Okay, so whenever you read the descriptions of Mexico City, 
In the 16th and 17th centuries, the one word that you keep on reading is Venice. So that was part of our rather manipulative reasoning for putting these two women together, but we actually have a bit of reasoning which is not that manipulative. One of the things that Serge Gruzinski points out about the early modern period is that because the worlds were joined, the Americas, Africa, and Europe, we can talk in another section and another event about Asia, all right? We can do that. Um, and ACMRS has done that with fine lecturers like Stephen West talking about China. We'll leave that for another event right now. Because the worlds come together, as Serge Brzezinski points out, there are going to be social conditions which are going to be imposed upon people worldwide now, which are going to create similar responses, whatever the culture, whatever the religion, whatever the language. And so women as far apart as the woman mistakenly called Malinche, whose name in Nahua, Nahua was the language spoken by the Mexica Indians, the ones we call Aztecs. It is a language spoken by roughly 8 million people today in Mexico. It is a very living language. Malintzin, which is her name in Nahua, alternately means either tongue or sharp blade of grass. And there's a reason for that double meaning here, because it will be words that create this woman, that create her identity. She will be the translator who, by one very terrible interpretation, facilitates the conquest of Mexico and betrays her country. Ooh, but that's an interpretation that comes from the 19th century. We're, we're not talking about the 19th, we're way before that. This lecture is going to take you through the 16th and 17th centuries. Arcangela Tarabotti will be a woman whose life is also going to be based on words. And about that, my colleague Marcia Fazio will speak to you very soon. And before I bring Marcia up here to add her bit to my introduction, I want to make this parallel clear to you, because there is a reason that we're connecting these two women, and it's not just because Arcangela Tarabotti was from Venice, and because all the conquistadors thought that Tenochtitlan looked like Venice. That, that's cute. That's trivial. That's for the Discovery Channel at 3 in the morning. <laughs> but the real reason that we're connecting them is the reason specified by Serge Gruzinski and Carolyn Dean, these two, these two very great scholars of the global renaissance, that because the joining of the world created conjoined social situations, women of all groups, as Carolyn Dean says, from the new to the old world. So that's the Aztecs and that's Italy. We're forced frequently to manipulate their destinies and to be agents of their destinies, if possible, in the same way. And those ways usually included what was behind the scenes. We're going to see that both Malinche and Arcangelo Tarabotti will come out from behind the scenes in very powerful ways. And we're going to challenge the stereotypes about Malinche as the super seductive whore who sold her country because she didn't even consider it her country. Mexico was not Mexico like Italy was not Italy. Italy was different city-states. What we call Mexico were different kingdoms who hated each other's guts. To fill you in a little bit about Arcangela before I begin on the Malinche, and then we take a break and then Marsha will continue on Arcangela. Marsha, come up here and say a few words about Arcangela and your vision of how she fits in. And neither of us use a microphone. <laughs> Both of us are New York loud. women, and neither of us need it. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say too much about Arcangela Tarabotti because I have a, a whole presentation prepared for you. But basically, we put these two women together because we felt they should go together mm -hmm. somehow. They're women who underwent different circumstances, uh, yet 
Yet they prevailed. Somehow they prevailed. Through the words. And yeah, through through their words, of course. One um, one actually through her words, uh, as you'll find uh, Sharon is going to talk to you about Malinche, uh, through her words, through her spoken words, and Arcangela through her written words. So, but I want you to make the connections. It, these are very human connections, and I, I want you to make it. So I'm not going to take any more time because I want Sharona to begin with She's her Malinche. Very herbose. Thank you. Remember that parallel that Marcia has just said was spoken and oral? Because just to cement, and the reason I'm doing this is because I'm cementing the connection because there is still a lot of opposition to the term global renaissance. Many people still feel we should only speak about one portion of Europe during that time, which is a bit ridiculous because the Serge Brzezinski points out, and remember, he's French. You cannot understand France or Italy or Spain or Sweden or any country in Europe without understanding what its connection was at that point with the rest of the world. Spoken and oral is very important here, and thank you for mentioning that, Marcia, because Malinche's words will never be written down, and we only know about her from what other people wrote about her, and drew about her, and said about her, and if you go to Mexico and you get into a car crash, God forbid, but nobody's hurt, but your cars are banged up. You're going to hear people getting out of their cars and not exactly speaking the most elegant poetry ever written in Mexico. And one thing they're going to say, and I apologize now to anyone of Hispanic background, like myself, because you know it's not nice what I'm going to say, that this is a phrase that you will hear in the streets of Mexico, and it is, chinga tu madre. <laughs> Which literally means, you know what's being said, Malinche is your mother. Now, look at the way history comes. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Americans have got to learn a bit more of their own history because when American guys get in a car crash, like I've never heard two men in Arizona scream at each other, Washington's your father or Lincoln's your uncle. <laughs> so the fact that she is so alive in the minds of all Mexicans and also of the Chicano population here in the Southwest, she is a very powerful image. And she never wrote anything down, but all of the male conquistadors and all of the male Aztec warriors who followed her, fought her, loved her, hated her, or both <coughs> credited her with the success of the conquest. In the 19th century, she was portrayed as an evil, but of course very seductive and pretty, prostitute. Well, we know one thing about her. She was no prostitute. That much we know. So who in heaven's name was she? You're looking at an image from something called El Lienzo de Tlaxcala, which is literally the canvas of Tlaxcala. This picture comes from 1552. And the first thing I want you to notice is that Malinche, do you see her? She's called Marina because that will be the name she takes when she is baptized by Cortes, the conquistador of Mexico. Notice that she is at Cortez's height. In fact, to make him taller, they've added a hat. And in all of the images of Cortez and Malinche, she is always recorded when it's the native peoples doing the drawings as being taller than Cortez. Was she taller than Cortez? She may have been, actually, I have to tell you, because all of the Spanish chroniclers report that the Aztecs were taller than they were. Now, when I use the term Aztecs, I'm using a very anachronistic term. The correct term is Mexica. Okay, so I'm going to be using these two interchangeably, and I hope to drag you over to Mexica, which is the actual term. There's no agreement on her. Even her birth is a mystery. It's recorded as 1504, but if she was born in 1504, when the conquistadors get to Mexico, what we call Mexico, she would have been 15, because the years that we're talking about are 1519 to 1521. These three years that are absolutely going to transform 
the New World. By the way, and I say that because later on what happens in Peru is based to a large degree on what happens in Mexico. This is going to be the model for the conquest. Male conquistador, female conquered Indian woman. Many Chicano writers have turned that paradigm around, but this is going to be the paradigm. Was she 15? Could a 15-year-old have helped to overturn an empire? Well, possibly if she was acting like any young 15-year-old slave of her time. I just used the word, slave. I know you all know that Europeans took slaves, and the European slave trade is justifiably pretty notoriously horrible. But guess what? I have some bad news for you. Europeans were not the only horrible people in that time. Everybody was horrible. And slavery, unfortunately, was a worldwide phenomenon. And the native peoples of the Americas also had slaves. And the Africans also had slaves. Let's just call it a worldwide disease. So if she was a 15-year-old slave given to Cortes, she would have been acting as any 15-year-old native woman of her time, given to a conqueror. You do what the conqueror wants. Except in Cortes's case, he was very lucky because he got a woman who was incredibly brilliant in languages. Now, where was she from? You know, there's such a curse on her in Mexico. When you don't like somebody, when somebody's selling out their country, you call them a malinchista. That yeah, means selling out your country to a foreigner. People don't even, for many years, didn't even want to discuss where she was born. No place wanted to claim her. You didn't want a sign saying Malinche was born here. <laughs> Not like those signs in New England that says George Washington slept here. Well, God knows what George Washington was doing, sleeping all over the place in New England. But you don't. Did you ever think of that? It's 20 million places in Connecticut, from Connecticut to Boston. George Washington. <coughs> no place wants to claim this woman. But recently, I'm happy to tell you, two very prominent historians have started to work on her, not as a notorious figure, but as a very, very crucial personage in Mexican history and New World history, because she represents, for better or for worse, the coming together of two worlds. And that included the violence and probably the rape. I very much doubt that Cortes was very tender with her, or that his first lieutenant, who was the first one he pawned her off on, was tender to her. So we also have to see her to a certain degree as a woman who was also a victim. And as a female slave of the time, she would have been raped. And she will have a son by Cortez, who ends up being Cortez's favorite son, Don Martin. So she is the coming together of the world, which doesn't mean a ah, friendly coming together. No. It's a very bloody, hideous coming together. And the chronicles, and for those of you writing anything down or want to know it, we will also through Marsha, Kendra and I will get you a bibliography if anyone wants to read further. But if you're writing anything down, I'm going to give you the name of the most prominent Spanish chronicler of the time who took his chronicles directly from Cortes. Now, God knows Hernán could lie when he wanted to. That chronicler is López de Gómara. G-O-M-A-R-A. Gómara. G-O-M-A-R-A. And he records her birth as being in Jalisco. Do you know what comes from Jalisco? You do know what comes from Jalisco. Anybody living in the Southwest has once upon a time drunk something that came from Jalisco. Tequila. You're close. <laughs> tequila. So tequila is from Jalisco. He records that place as the place of her birth. But archaeology places it more on the coast in an area we're going to call Pinala. So she's either born on the Pacific coast or the Atlantic coast, and nobody wants to claim it. <coughs> Here's the last name I will give you, and now we'll just get into her story, but I think it's important for you to have some sources, right? Because some people tend to think I'm very entertaining, but I make things up as I go along. <laughs> so there are sources. And the final source I'm going to give you, and then we'll just get a bibliography to you. Luis Barjau, L-U-I-S, and Barjau, B-A-R-J-A-U, V. 
very, very prominent Mexican archaeologist who has written a wonderful book in Spanish translated into English. The book in Spanish is called El, Mon El Monarca y la Faraute, and in English that is The Monarch and the Counselor. And he has basically spent the past 20 years poring over every document that would have been contemporary in Malinche's time, piecing her story together. So was she born in Jalisco? Probably not. Cortez was lying, but then you're going to see he lied about most things. And of course, when he started his affair with Malinche, he already had a wife back in Spain, but that's par for the phone, sir. She was probably born around here. And that's not just any place, because this area, the Painala region, is close to the Mayan territories, where well, the Mayan Indians do not want to claim her. Because the Mayan Indians were one group that fought the Aztecs, they fought the Spanish, and they do not want Malinche, who is a national symbol of betrayal, even though we know that idea also, as I said before, comes basically from the 19th century, they do not want her on their turf. But I will tell you, much as they don't want her on their turf, she probably was from their turf because she spoke a dialect of the Mayan language, which would have been very hard for her to learn in the roughly half a year that she was down there. As an anthropologist, I worked with the Mayans and the Andeans. But now I'm just going to talk about the Mayans because we're in this part. My Mayan colleagues would flay me alive for saying what I said, but most of the research is pointing to the fact she probably was Mayan, but maybe not. The other theory is that her parents were what you call Pochteca. Pochteca means merchants who were sent from the area around what you now call Mexico City, what the conquistadors called the New Venice, and what the Aztecs, of course, called Tenochtitlan, that they were traders who were sent into that territory to hold it for the Aztec Empire. Probably her father was an Aztec, or Mexica, and her mother was from another group called the Popoluca. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because this has something to do with her crazy story. We don't even know where she was born. Let's say she was born in Painala. Oy, look at these images. We don't know where she was born. We don't even know what she looked like. Is either of those images her? Probably she was half Mexica, half Aztec on her father's side. Her mother was either Mayan or Popoluca. Why is this important? Because when Malinche is about 13 years old, her father dies. And we know that her father had designated her to inherit his wealth. That is actually something that was allowed by both Mexica and Maya tradition. Her mother did not like this. We know this from a chronicler who followed Cortez by the name of Bernal Diaz, who became very close friends with Malinche. And her mother sold her into slavery. What did she look like? Okay, so. When Kendra found this wonderful image for me, I told her I would flay her alive if she wanted to put it into the PowerPoint. But she was right to insist that it be in the PowerPoint. Because if we talk about the crazy romanticized image of Malinche from the 19th century, there it is. Look at Cortez, look at Malinche. This is Sir Lancelot and Queen Guinevere, and not even the way they looked, but the way the 19th century imagined them. And she looks about as Aztec as I look Japanese, and he wouldn't have been that clean. You know that the conquistadors bathed about once every three months, and when Montezuma actually first interviewed Cortes, he fainted. And that's according to the Spanish chroniclers, because the odor was, they bathed once every three months. So, so it wasn't that beautiful. On the other side, you have a famous image of Cortez and the Malinche, which is also stylized, and that was made by the great Mexican muralist Orozco. Very different image, much more monolithic, much less pretty. Of course, delving into their sexual relationship much more, because Cortez, when he receives Malinche as a slave, she's going to be one of 20 slaves given to him, by 
a local lord. Ay, 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 look at her here. Ay, ay, ay. Of course, they're going to initiate a sexual relationship, which she probably had absolutely no say in. And remember, in the role she would have been in as either a Mayan or Aztec slave, as a woman, she would have been forced to submit. Did she look like this? Or is this the kind of locker room fantasy of Mexico's greatest murals? I think I just gave away my own opinion, though, didn't I? I will guarantee you if she looked one way, it wasn't like this. Because Diego Rivera, who of course you've heard of, Mexico's most famous muralist, I actually prefer the other one, Orozco, but a very great muralist, has painted her in the style of an Aztec whore. So you see her lifting her, don't you like the subtlety with the skirt? And she is tattooed, which only prostitutes in Tenochtitlan. That's the Aztec capital. You call it Mexico City. The original name is Tenochtitlan. Only the whores of Tenochtitlan had their legs tattooed. There is absolutely nothing in the chronicles of the time to suggest that she was a prostitute. Absolutely nothing. One of Cortez's companions, Bernal Diaz, from whom we take a great deal of historical uh, background on Malinche, says that she was not beautiful, but she was attractive. And he says, quote unquote, y no era puta. She was not a whore. But she was bold. So she would have shown more, we would say now, agency, personal initiative, than most women of the time, be they European or Native American. But the painter like this is a disservice. And yet this is the way the 19th century reimagined her. You want to blame the fall of the Aztecs on someone? A woman. Who like a woman? Right? Since the time of the Garden of Eden. This is the Mexican Eve. There is a very great modern day Chicano writer by the name of Maria Herrero Lubeck, who has said, in the Mexican imagination, she becomes Eve. She destroys the empire. Well, is that really right? But look at this image, because this image, it has taken years to get beyond. What are on? Sorry? Somebody holding an arm that's hanging, am I seeing any correct? Yeah. Just to the right of the right. Oh yeah, that's a severed arm. <laughs> that good. No, not good that it's a severed arm. Good that. Okay. You know the Hopi Indians of the Southwest are the cousins of the Mexica of the Aztecs, and the Hopi, back about the 13th century, had a very profound split with the people who would later call themselves the Mexica come down from the southwest and colonize Mexico and become the Aztecs, and the split was over the issue of human sacrifice. We don't have time to go into that whole thing now, but I will point out to you that here in Arizona, um, the origin of um, that split actually between Arizona and New Mexico, a place called Chaco Canyon, um, the people split off, and if you want to know more about that, that I'll, I'll tell you about that afterwards. But Yes, there was human sacrifice among the Aztecs. They were hated for that by the other native peoples. And this is why it would be so easy for Cortes to conquer at the beginning, because the other peoples are sick and tired of handing over human sacrifice as tribute to the Aztecs. Now, of course, the Spanish bring their own version of human sacrifice, and it was called the Inquisition. And burning people alive <laughs> is probably no more fun than dismembering them. But yes, that is a dismembered arm. Very important. Where did they have their first meeting? Okay. How old is she? Let's say she was born in 1500. The two dates given are 1504-1500. Let's say 1500, so she can be at least 19 at this meeting. Somehow the idea of her as a 15-year-old at this meeting is a little jarring. Except when I tell you what is recorded in this first meeting by Bernal Diaz, you know, you wonder who Diaz was. He's one of the conquistadors. Was he basically just kind of leering at Cortes and Malinche the whole time? Well, some of his chronicle makes you feel he was. And of course, there's a telenovela connected with that because he was also in love with her. And he claims that they first meet 
in a place called Sempoala. We'll be showing you this on the map. After she had been handed over as a slave a few times. And by this point, she spoke four languages. She spoke Mexica, Nahua. She spoke one of the Mayan languages. She spoke Popoluca, and she also spoke one of the Tabascan languages. She's about to learn Spanish now. She was one of the 20 best slaves that the chief of Sempoala was going to give to Cortes because he was going to make a deal with Cortes. I give you soldiers, you attack the Aztecs, you free me. That was the first part of the deal. Of course, the second part of the deal, they didn't realize, which is that Cortes would impose a very harsh domination on men. But Cortes was very careful not to reveal that at that point. But Cortes was having difficulties because he didn't speak Nahua. He didn't speak any of the languages, so all of this is going on in sign language, with the exception of one person he had taken who had been shipwrecked on the Mayan shore and spoke a little bit of Mayan. Suddenly he gets this gift of 20 slaves. And one of the slaves, according to Bernal Dia, is Malin Sin, a little sharp piece of grass, as her name means. And Diaz claims. This slave was watching Cortes very intently when Cortes unsheathed his sword and goes to, do you know that, anybody know which tree this is? This is a very important tree in Central American tradition. This is the tree that upholds the universe. You know in Norse mythology there's the idea of the world tree, the Yggdrasil, right? How badly did I mispronounce that? So Mesoamerican theology also has the idea of the world being spun around a tree through the lower world, the middle world, and the top world. That's called the Seba. And that is the most sacred tree in Mesoamerican tradition. And according to the story by Bernal Dia, Cortez unsheaths his sword, and to show who's master here now, he starts chopping off the branches of the Seba tree. Do you understand what a horrible religious affront that is going to be, okay? It's like burning a church, or burning a synagogue, or burning a mosque. It is the most violent action. And that causes the other slaves to flee, except one. Guess who? Well, remember, this is Bernal Diaz talking. Did she really do this? I don't know. We don't have her words. We only have a million descriptions by men who usually wanted to have sex with her. You notice I didn't say to make love, because I really don't think that was the main impulse. So, these stories are slanted. But Bernal Diaz says, she ran out to Cortes at that point, and took his sword, and knelt down in front of him, and kissed the sword. Was that Diaz's fantasy? <laughs> Possibly. Cute tree for a first romantic encounter. Because that tree has such a powerful meaning in Mesoamerican, when I say Mesoamerican, I'm referring to Mexican and Central America. In Mesoamerican tradition, Cortes destroying that tree would have sent a very clear message now to his other native allies, I'm not 100% on your side. In other words, be frightened of me, because I'm a different god. Now, Cortes gets Malinche. Apparently, he was not as thrilled with her as she was with him, if she was thrilled with him at all, if that story is at all true. And he pawns her off on one of his, one of his lieutenants, a man by the name of Alonso Puerto Carrero. But then one day, he discovers that Malinche speaks the Aztec tongue. And this is important because he is on the road to the Aztec capital. <coughs> this is the glyph, the hieroglyph, that represents the place where Cortes and Malinche had their first meeting. It is called Sempoala. And it is here that Cortes discovers, oh my god, this young slave I just got doesn't just speak this babble, quote unquote, of native languages. She speaks Nahua. She speaks 
the Mexica language. She can be used. Till this point, he was using another translator who wasn't very good, somebody by the name of Jerónimo de Aguila, who spoke a little bit of the Mayan language, none of the Aztec. Now he has a slave who speaks one of the Mayan languages fluently and the Aztec language fluently, and if we are going to believe Cortes himself, he says, in his Cartas de Relación, in his memoirs, that she learned perfect Spanish within three months. <coughs> She's a very brilliant woman, whose words, as Marsha reminded you, are oral. They are never, unfortunately, she was never given the chance to record them. Now look at the route that they take. Cortes had landed at what we call today Veracruz. Sempoala, do you see it? That's where he and Malinche meet for the first time. He was 34. She was, let's say, either 15 or 19. And the road to Tenochtitlan, do you see it there in the middle, the lake? That's why it was called the Venice of the New World. Just like Venice, it was a city of canals. By the way, when the Spaniards drained the canals, that also had a terrible effect in terms of earthquakes. If you remember the hideous earthquake that affected Mexico City in 1985, one of the reasons that the effect was so strong was because the land had been drained. So the conquistadors did no favors. Sempoala is the first meeting Cortes, she, she speaks now while Cortes takes her from his first lieutenant and says, you're going to be mine. Now, what did she think? We have no way of knowing what she thought. We have absolutely no way of knowing. Did she prefer Cortes to Puerto Carrero? We have no way of knowing that. Her words are not known to us. We only have the words of men writing about her. And you notice I say men writing about her. That will be even more problematic because these were men who also sexually desired her. So were they writing their own fantasy? Would Cortes admit that she didn't desire him? You know he can't admit that. She will behave as any slave will behave. The difference will be, because she is so stunningly talented in languages, her value to him will be above and beyond that of any other quote-unquote slave. The notoriety that Malinche, who now as we go into the year 1520, is Cortes's translator, and also, if we want to use the terminology of the 19th century, his mistress. That's 19th century terminology. I will use 16th century terminology. She was a slave. This is where her role becomes particularly notorious. Cholula. When you visit Mexico, you will probably first go to the beautiful place next to Cholula, which is called Puebla. And what you're looking at is a church in Puebla, which of course is the Spanish colonial town built on top of the ruins of Cholula, although part of Cholula still exists next door to Puebla. But most of what Puebla stands on was old pre cortesian Cholula. What was Cholula? It was the second most holy city for the Mexica. It is the spot that Cortes will stop at on the road to Tenochtitlan. This road where he is making alliances and gaining Indian allies. How is he gaining them? Through her. Can he speak to them? He can't say one word to them. Any dialogue between Cortes and the native lords is done with Malintzin in the middle. So for the native peoples of Mexico, as Luis Parjao has pointed out, she is much more the central figure of the conquest. That's also one reason why in the Liento de, de Tlaxcala, um, all, all of the canvases from Tlaxcala and other places in Mexico, she is portrayed as so much bigger than he is. By this point, Malinche has made a very, very important alliance for Cortes. And they are the Indians who, well, Indians is also a rather stupid term to use because Columbus thought he'd arrived in India. 
They are the nation who had the most problems with the Mexica. They are called the Tlaxcalans. She has brought them in now as allies, the Cortes. Why she brought them in? She was told to do so. She does so. They will stop at Cholula before they get to Tenochtitlan, to the Aztec capital, and there something very notorious will occur. It is one of the most notorious of many notorious massacres in the history of the conquest of Mexico. Cholula is particularly notorious because, as the archaeologist Luis Barjal points out, and as I can tell you because I worked at that site for four years, there were so many people killed there, we are still digging up bodies. When the INA, which is the state institution of archaeology and anthropology and history in Mexico, conducts the digs, which are still ongoing, yes, they're still turning up bodies. So there's a massive, massive massacre of Cholulans committed by Cortes and the 19th century says it was Malinche who precipitated it. Now isn't that funny? 300 years after it happens, people in the 19th century suddenly decide she precipitated it. Let's leave the 19th century demonization of her aside and even the conquistadors didn't say that. If we go back to Bernal Diaz's Chronicle. If we go back to Lopez de Gomara's chronicle, although Gomara was never actually in the New World, but he is the one that Cortes speaks to, neither of them say that. What they say is that she reported to Cortes a plot that she heard, which she had to report to him. Remember, she is his slave. And that on the basis of her report, Cortes makes the decision to commit a huge massacre in the Great Pyramid of Cholula. That is not quite the same as saying she precipitated the massacre. But everything written about Malinche since that time has portrayed her as the great villainess of that episode. The Great Pyramid of Cholula, well, until Cortes raised it to the ground at the end of 1520, it was the world's largest pyramid, greater than the Pyramid of Chaos in Egypt. When you visit it now, you can see that from the bases of it, Cortes destroyed about nine-tenths of it. That's where the massacre took place. That's where archaeology has shown us that at least 6,000 people were killed there. And I'm unhappy to tell you the bodies are still coming up. So yes, yeah, something horrible happened there. To blame it on her, I think, is a little bit warped. But it is very important to see the way this episode is misused. Any idea what you're looking at there? I'll give you a hint. It's actually in the Great Pyramid. <coughs> okay, this is called the sacrificial stairway. And again, now we have to be careful here because do the chroniclers exaggerate the amount of human sacrifice that took place? Yeah, they do exaggerate it. At one point, they have Aztec emperors killing 100,000 people in one day, which would have been kind of impossible, because that was the entire population of Tenochtitlan. So numbers like that are impossible. <coughs> did human sacrifice exist? Yes, it certainly did. I have said before, and I will point out to you again, Spain had its own version of human sacrifice, but yes, there was human sacrifice. And it was usually warriors who were sacrificed, so was it that different? To European warfare, in European warfare, you killed the person on the battlefield. In traditional Nawa warfare, you brought the prisoner of war back and sacrificed them. Both ways are fairly brutal. This is one of the only interior parts of that pyramid that exists, and according to legend, and it is only legend, this is where Malinche hid and wept during that massacre. Who's the person who says she ran in and wept? That is the chronicler Lopez de Gomara. Is his testimony a little problematic? Yes. Why? He was never in Mexico. Although Cortes sits and tells him the story. Will we believe everything Cortes says? How does that joke go in English? If you do, I have land to sell you in Florida or something like that. So I don't know. What if the story is real? What if Cortes was not lying when he said she didn't wept? that actually might be much more consonant with the confusion and pain she would have felt. Okay? Because as another very great Mexican writer by the name of Elena Poniatowska points out, 
She was living a time of transition that couldn't even be imagined by either Europeans or Native Americans. Look at how old she probably was. And now compare this image, which is a much more recent image of Malin Sin, showing her as a young girl. And actually, here she looks more 15 than 19. And I point out to you again, half of the chroniclers insist she was born in 1504 which would have made her 15 when Cortes met her, and 18 by the time Tenochtitlan was conquered. This is her antagonist, a Tlaxcalan prince who said to the other Tlaxcalans, don't join with Cortes. He will bring you something worse than, than the Mexica. In the 19th century, Malinche was portrayed as having seduced Xicotencal, that's his name, gotten rid of him, and then the road is open for the alliance between the Spaniards and the Tlaxcalans. Is there any proof of that? Absolutely none. Absolutely none. Is there any proof that the Mexica, or the Aztecs as we call them, were waiting for the white god? Well, the story is, let's talk about this because this is really a bit of a messy confusion. So Malintzin now leads Cortes into Tenochtitlan, into the capital of the Mexica, Montezuma, or Moctezuma, as he should be called in Nahua, is very, very ambivalent about Cortes. He's been trying to stave off Cortes coming in by sending him gifts. But of course, those gifts have only served to whet the conquistador's appetite. Now, how do the Spanish chroniclers describe this? They say Montezuma thought that Cortes was the white god they were waiting for. Let me ask you a question. Would any of the Spanish chroniclers have been able to speak with Montezuma? No. So who were they hearing that from? Maybe Malintzin. Do we know what Malintzin said when she stood between Moctezuma and Cortes? We have no idea. But we know that Cortes was completely dependent upon her, and she, to a certain degree, leads the conquest, if you want to use those terms. Remember, she is just obeying Cortes. But what she tells Cortes, according to the chroniclers, is, you are the great white god they have waited for. Or at least that is the story that so many of the chroniclers will write down. Is it possible the whole thing is invented? Yeah, it's possible the whole thing was invented as an a priori justification for the conquest. It's also possible that these stories go back to a more common motif in Mexica, Maya, and Andean tradition, which speaks about someone coming much earlier, but having red or blonde hair, and teaching them some arts, and they teach this person some of the arts of civilization, and they come together, and then this person goes back over the sea on a dragon boat and says, one day he'll come back. If that person existed, he might have looked, I'm scary, more like that. That could have been a Viking or a Celt, but it sure as heck was not a Spaniard. A very important, very important writer by the name of Gloria Faldua, a very important figure in Chicano literature, has pointed out that the story of the white god is manipulated to an extraordinary degree by the Spanish chroniclers as an a priori justification. Meaning, because there were actually people in Spain questioning the rightness of the conquest. I don't want you to think that everybody in Spain thought it was a great idea. There were actually many humanists in Spain who said, this is kind of crazy. We don't have a right to do what we're doing. And Cortez's response was, but I'm the god they were waiting for. And then, of course, he could blame it on what Malintzin told him, but do we actually know what she told him? The great temple at Tenochtitlan was only seen once by a woman, and that would have been Malintzin. 
and she accompanied Cortez into one of the rooms, the rooms that have the ad of the sacred statue of the rain god Tlaloc. She accompanied him into that room together with Montezuma. She was the only woman to see that in the history of Tenochtitlan. Women were not allowed in that room. God knows what she herself would have felt, but as that writer, Gloria Salua, points out, what she would have felt would have defied words. This was something that did not happen in her world. What was actually said in that exchange well, we know of that only through Cortez. And Cortez claims that Montezuma said to me, welcome back, my returning divinity. That's what he heard from Alinson. That's what he says he heard. I want you to think of the very conflictive status of this young woman, translating for two potentates who could not speak to each other, translating not only language, but cultural language. Her words still remain a mystery. According to the Cartas de Relacion, to Cortez's own memoirs, what horrified Cortez, and this is rather funny, it's going to horrify a hardened conquistador like him, was an image of Coyol Shauki, that's the sister of the war god, dismembered. Oh, he was horrified by that. God knows he never did anything like that. <laughs> But reading Cortez, you also have to read the way he wants himself remembered. So, of course, he doesn't mention what he did at Cholula other than to say, it was my duty, but he will quite go to town on whatever looked bloodthirsty to him in Mexico culture. Very important word in Nahuatl, Nepantla. Pantla literally means to be in the middle. This is always her status. Look at her between Cortez and Montezuma. This is another image of the Mexican muralists from the 20th century. So I can't tell you this is historically accurate, but it was accurate to put her constantly in the middle. And she is the one who will tell Montezuma, Cortez is now taking you hostage. Or as Cortez supposedly imagined it, you are going to be a guest of Cortez, which means your reign is over. The Spaniards are run out of Tenochtitlan temporarily. Malinsin follows Cortez on his horse. And look what the old conquistador writes. He says she walked very well. That was gallant of him. <laughs> she was five months pregnant with his child. And he rides the horse and she walks down. And that was a bit outlandish even by the standards of the time, but it's rather in keeping with his personality. The Spaniards go back and lay siege to the city. It was a very brutal siege. It's a siege in which nobody comes out very noble. Let's deal with some hard questions. Was there cannibalism during that siege? Mm -hmm. And the Spaniards and the Aztecs are much like Scallons all engaged in them. So Cortes couldn't exactly pretend to be holier than thou in terms of brutality. Bernal Diaz writes that Cortes gives permission to his Tlaxcalan allies to cannibalize the bodies of the Aztecs. So let's not imagine that his only purpose in coming to Tenochtitlan was to spread the faith. Because he had no problem doing things that were utterly opposed to Christianity, as long as it served his purpose. And do remember, if that story about the white god is really true, what was he doing accepting the status of a white god if he supposedly was coming to bring Christianity? So in terms of the consistency of his own behavior and what Malinsin had to deal with, it's going to be very difficult. The siege, of course, ends. It was, a, it was a very, very bloody. It ends on August 23rd. 1521. If you visit Mexico City today, I very much recommend you go to the spot where that siege ends. It's called Tlatelolco. It's very famous for another reason, because there will be another massacre there in 1968. But that's another contemporary political story. Very sad place. There is a plaque in Tlatelolco that stands, and I want to quote it right now because I think, um, I think the Mexican writer 
who wrote that plaque says it much better than I do. His name is Carlos Monsiváis. He says, on this site, in 1521, the Aztec Empire tumbled down. The Spanish Empire rose up. It was neither celebratory nor tragic. It is the harsh beginning of the contemporary Mexican people. Make his words say it best. In terms of the harsh beginning of the contemporary Mexican people, I think that is the perspective from which Malinche has to be viewed. She was not the 19th century prostitute who sold out her people. We don't even know who her people were. Were they the Mexica? Were they the Maya? Were they the Popoluca? Were they possibly both? Was she of mixed parentage, as, as Gomara claimed she was? And what happens to her following the siege of Tenochtitlan? Now, she, she already has a son by Cortez. Well, you know he's not going to marry her, obviously, because of course he has a wife waiting for him in Spain. She's discarded after the siege. Well, she's not 100% discarded. Now, we have to be very careful here, because there's a certain line of contemporary literature which claims that she is abandoned. We have to watch it with this, because the historical facts do not show that. Cortez sets her up alone in a house in what is now called Coyoacan in Mexico City. Of course, he, the name Tenochtitlan now is erased. It will be La Ciudad de Mexico, Mexico City. He does not live with her in that house. At that point, he was having an affair with four of the daughters of Montezuma, so he no longer had any time, nor was she necessary. But he does not abandon her economically. He actually supports her. In fact, not only does he support her economically, I have to tell you, historically, we know there is a legal paper in Mexico City stating this. This is one of the documents brought by the archaeologist, Luis Barjao. She was actually given control of melting gold in that area for three years. So it's probable she actually became wealthy. So as much as some writers might like the idea of Malinche is abandoned, that's not 100% true. Does that mean I'm trying to say Cortez was nice? No, he was absolutely hideous. He would have done this for his own reasons, and his own reasons were now the son that he had with her. But he's going to pawn her off on someone else. Ah, oh, thank you, Kendra. Kendra took revenge on Cortez. <laughs> this is what he's deserved for 500 years. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, there he is. Let's see. He wasn't a bad looking guy, of course. Yeah, men like that are never bad looking. Because he was a ladies' man. He was notorious for that. That's, by the way, why he was kicked out of Spain. He had to leave Salamanca quickly, where he dropped out of his law degree because he had an affair with one of his professor's wives. He had to leave Cuba for a similar reason. He already left a quote unquote mestizo <coughs> child in Cuba, by the way. Don Martin was not his first child with a native woman. He had a daughter with a Taino Indian woman, whom he recognizes, although apparently he never supports economically. Cortez brings his wife over from Spain. He's married Malinche off to somebody by the name of Juan Jaramillo. And now he will get his comeuppance, but not before he strangles his Spanish wife. Because Catalina Suarez had only come over for three months. She was with him for three months. And she complained to the authorities that Cortez was beating her. Okay, now, this is very important. Because when we talk about a man of his times, I will tell you that even other Spaniards of his time had a problem with Cortez. And we cannot excuse everything he did by simply calling him a man of his time. I saw your hand and I saw your hand. Can I ask you to just let me finish with the slide and then I'll take your question and your question. He was known to be brutal even by the standards of his time. And when his wife, Catalina Suarez, actually complained about it before the judicial authorities, what happens? Well, on December 1st, 1524, she wakes up dead. She was strangled. Who was responsible? 
1980. Remember at this point, Cortez is now having many legal problems because his own soldiers are now having law cases against him. Why? He promised that the booty would be divided, right? The king gets 20%, what we call in Spanish, la quinta real. But the other guys were supposed to get something. He did not even divide it up equitably among the other conquistadors. So I want you to understand that when we use that excuse of a man of his time, it doesn't quite fit. Because even in his, in his own time, men of his own time were criticizing him, and so were women. Malinche is supposed to have been terrified when Catalina was killed. And she, and this now we know from legal documents, so her story is not such a mystery. Because actually, there are a ton of legal documents about Malinche's life from 1524 to 1529. She moves with Juan de Jaramillo to another part of the city to be farther away from Cortez. Because Cortez is now showing up at their home because he wants Malinche to accompany him on another conquest. She does not want to go. Who do we know that from? Maybe somebody who was a more reliable source, the man who would become her husband, Juan de Jaramillo, who apparently she loved, and who lived with her and adopted Don Martin, because you know that Cortez wasn't going be a good father to him. She does marry Juan de Jaramillo. They apparently had a happy marriage. And we know that from Cortez's old companion, Bernal Diaz, who also, remember, was in love with her. Because Diaz records that Cortez was furious that Malinsin did not want to accompany him on the conquest of Honduras. But he forces her to. She wants to stay with Jaramillo. He forces her to accompany him. But Honduras is a failure. And the Mayan Indians do not submit in the way the Aztecs do. The Aztecs fought hard for a brief time. And then the submission was sudden and quick. The Mayas never submitted. They still didn't submit in the 20th century. Have you ever heard of something called the Zapatista Rebellion in the 1990s? So they, they do not buy the story of white gods. And the Mayas had another weapon. They had renegade Spaniards who joined them and taught them to use guns and horses. So they were not particularly terrified by Cortes and his hordes. And that conquest fails. Malinche goes back to Juan de Jaramillo. And Cortes, according to the legal documents, shows up in their home and screams at Jaramillo, and Jaramillo throws him out. Maybe he finally got what he deserved. Maybe not. The image on the side comes from 1968. So does the image on the other side. The picture <coughs> still exists. The statue doesn't. That statue was destroyed in a major student riot in 1968. That statue before had been called La Sagrada Familia, the Holy Family. Cortez Malinche and little Don Martin, a rather idealized image of what that probably was. During the student riots of 1968, that statue went away of old flesh. Did it really? Well, actually not. It was beaten up. It was restored. It is actually in a small museum in Mexico City. It is very problematic, but it also shows you what the rewriting of history is. You had a question. You had a question. Yes, I, I, Back in the time of the conquest of Mexico, you had a question. Yes, thank you, because you've been uh, waiting for I'm just This hardly has anything to do with what, go for it. what this happened, but there was a rather great uh, general that went up a similar path that you showed in that slide in 1847, mm -hmm. by the name of Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. I believe he took that either that exact path or a similar path. Well, you know, he conquered the halls of Montezuma and the Marine him song in the halls of Montezuma. I just thought that was cool. Ooh, and isn't that an American retelling of it? Because the Mexicans would say, yes, that's part of the American invasion yeah. of yeah, Mexico. Yeah. And then, of course, you have to add the response to that in Chapultepec then. Yeah, that was a terrible one. 
push that one. Uh, but yes, that same route was taken because it was the route in which the flanks, the military flanks of Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, were the most vulnerable. And also because, and I think this is particularly interesting in the case of Robert E. Lee, because Lee mentions that so many years later, that area of Tlaxcala still had tremendous antipathy to the area of Mexico. Yes, but it was the same route, and he was following Cortez's route exactly. And you have a question. <coughs> This, as we come full circle, is again the canvas of Tlaxcala. The writer I mentioned to you before, Gloria Anzaldúa, refers to Malinche as a symbol of what she calls la pugna cultural continua, ongoing cultural conflict. And I think that's a much more interesting way to look at Malinche than the rather crazy way Diego Rivera looked at her or the way she has been demonized by so many writers throughout history, because she embodied that conflict. Can we say she facilitated the conquest of Mexico? We can say that her linguistic skill played a huge part in it. It may have speeded things up, but let me say together with one of Mexico's most important archaeologists, who is Barjal, it would have happened without her as well. It would have been more messy. It would not have been as quick. But there is no way that the imperial Spanish enterprise would have only been dependent on her. So to blame her with the collapse of Tenochtitlan is unfair. But there's another way to look at her as well, which may be equally problematic. In recent years, the image of her as forger of her own destiny and creator of her own, we say in Spanish, su propio yo, that is equally her own being, her own myself. Can we say that about it? Those are also terms from the 19th century. That's 19th century individualism. Was she consciously creating her own being? We have no idea. But did she possibly do that by the end? Yes. Because she does refuse to go back to Cortes. Because Cortes is furious at this. Because that is the one conquest he never got. And then she is found dead. Yeah, kind of Catalina Suarez-like. On the steps of what had been the great temple of Tenochtitlan when she was a total of either 24 or 29 years old. Well, now that's one version, and I have to give you another version. There is an English historian right now, very important in colonial history, by the name of Hugh Thomas, who is looking through other documents related to Maliche in Spain. Ah, because Cortes, when he went back to Spain, spoke about her a lot. And those documents record her as being alive even after Cortes dies. Those documents speak of her as being alive till 1551. So we have no, I, no way of knowing for sure if she died at 29 or did she at least make it into her early 50s. We have no way of knowing when she was born. We have no way of knowing when she died. So I would agree with Gloria Anzaldúa that instead of either praising her as a symbol of personal agency or condemning her as the demon who sold out Mexico, we should look at her as a woman of her time who was somehow able to carve out a destiny for herself through the use of the spoken word. And as Anzaldúa says, that doesn't necessarily mean that she was conscious of what she was doing or knew of what its impact would be. But that does not make her achievement any less. Question? Yes. Uh, 
And there you have, that's a brilliant image Kendra found, I think. Can, I, can we all have a kind of applause for this lovely woman? Because without the power of <laughs> Without the power of like this lecture might have been in midair for you. Because with all these names that you might not have been familiar with, but now you are. Um, thank you very much, dear. Because I think it's very important to have a visual ballast for what we're talking about. Again, on Falua's words, not mine. I like stealing from Gloria Anfaldua, she's a good writer. Just conflict, as Anfaldua says, there is no end to this story. There is no happy end, there is no tragic end. It's harshness, remember what Bonsi Weiss says, the harsh beginning of the contemporary Mexican people. It's harshness, it's unresolved aspects. That is Malim Sin. And in, in, in Malim Sin, we can find as Monsi Weiss says, that messy story from which we all come. And now he's not only speaking as Mexicans, he's speaking as anybody born or living in the New World. Because the New World, that's where you are now, is a very interesting, and as he puts it, disparatado, messy mixture of cultures, and from this mess we come. So we will leave her as being utterly unresolved.